Welcome, everybody. I'm Bruce Meyer, and on behalf of Ball State University and my co-directors, Paul Lasso and Beth Vanderwolf, uh, we're happy to have you here for the fifth day of University 90 on Common Ground. Along with a little rain, we've had another exciting day of events and ideas, and beginning last evening with a beautiful performance by Leonard Atherton and the Ball State Orchestra, followed by the insights of uh, Dr. Betty Edwards. Today we saw presentations by Mark Olson, Larry Bell, Marshall Kruder, a.k.a. Ramanujan, and others covering topics ranging from architecture from outer space to the therapeutic touch in nursing, uh, disabled aerobics, literacy in America, women in Asia, painting in motion, Indian poetry in America, and a wonderful variety of exhibits, musical performances, po uh, poetry in America, and uh, tomorrow we hope to see just as promising a schedule. Focusing on the keynote speaker for tomorrow evening, Dr. Sylvia Earle, the first woman, Aquana. We'll get to the formal introduction in just a moment, uh, but I, I feel uh, compelled to say that James Burke is here at last. I say that because we tried to bring him here for University 88, and with a conflict uh, on another project, we were, we were unable to do that. However, he only found out a moment ago that I kept his letter of refusal, <laughs> which is very polite, but in case I needed it, I had circled a comment at the end of it in which he says, if there should turn out to be another occasion when the university felt I could be of use. I should be delighted to do whatever I could to help. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have to use that line, but he agreed willingly to come and be with us tonight. The reason we were so intent on having James Burke come is that I think more than any other person, the messages that he's tried to bring across in a variety of stunning works summarizes what University City is all about, what the model means. And that is that the great innovations in thinking and technology throughout history have occurred as a result of a connection of ideas. We hope that you've already made some connections this week and will especially enjoy this evening's connection. It's now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Burke's faculty host, Dr. Beverly Pitts, who is an associate professor of journalism and the director of the Center for Academic Assessment and General Studies. Dr. Pitts. It is so appropriate for our celebration of university and the search for uncommon ground beyond our comfortable disciplinary environments that we welcome James Burke a man who builds intellectual bridges. His career itself is a model of the interdisciplinary thinker. He's a journalist, educator, philosopher, historian, and scientist who happens also to hold a degree from, in English literature from Oxford University. Mr. Burke is best known to us as an author and television host. His three television series, Connections, The Real Thing, and The Day the Universe Changed, explored the development of technology and helped us understand the connections between scientific discovery and the nature of human perception. He has hosted a number of programs for the BBC since he joined them in 1966, including a weekly science program, the Burke Special, and he was chief reporter on the U.S. and Russian space flight programs. He's currently work working on his next series, which takes us to the world of modern communication systems. In November, his newest television special will air on PBS. He has described the special, titled After the Warming, as a detective story told by means of a journey through time. As a thinker and writer, Mr. Burke will not let his audiences sit still. In all of his work, he challenges us to move to the uncommon ground. Tonight, he will be speaking on mechanisms of change. Do lemons whistle? Will you join me in welcoming Mr. James Burke?
I've never spoken in a tent before in Muncie. And it was suggested I might have begun by saying brothers and sisters. <laughs> I don't know what that meant. Anyway, as you heard from that extremely kind introduction, uh, I'm one of those people that Mark Twain put his finger on when he described the kind of thing that people like I do, when he said once, in the real world, the right thing never happens in the right place at the right time. It is the task of journalists and historians to rectify this error. <laughs> and I suppose I've spent the better part of the last 25 years rectifying errors in the area of the history of science and technology, looking at its effect on us and vice versa, and talking, I suppose, all the time, essentially, to people with a keen interest in information. And in those terms, you particular bunch of people here tonight are, I suppose, pretty close to the horse's mouth as far as that kind of stuff goes. So in the interest of keeping you from dozing off too soon tonight, I thought during this speech I would move metaphorically gradually towards the other end of the horse. <laughs> because when you talk, as I would like to this evening, about stuff like why we seem to be coming up to a watershed in human history in terms of what we mean by the social effects of information, changes in our traditional concept of what knowledge is, the mechanisms of change themselves, forecasting and other such fashionable material, there is an awful lot of manure to pick your way through, particularly when it comes to gazing into the old crystal ball. But then up to now, I think it's always been like that. And I say up to now because I think things are going to change. Let's begin by taking a quick look at what it's been like so far. Take the case of your average medieval man in the street who, when asked what he might think of the prospect that one day everybody in the modern world would have their own personal individual form of transportation to go where they chose, when they chose, would have fallen off his bar stool laughing at the idea of such a world where the cities of the future would inevitably come to a total standstill, as they inevitably would have to when every street was 14 feet deep in horse dung. The concept of any 20th century form of transportation, logically enough, being beyond this medieval person. And the reason for this somewhat limited view of the future, which uh, seems to have been the case since Noah was forecasting clear skies, was once brilliantly explained by the great modern philosopher Wittgenstein. Somebody apparently went up to Wittgenstein once and said, what a bunch of morons we pre-Copernican Europeans must have been to have looked up in the sky and to have thought that what we were seeing up there was the sun going round the earth. When as any kid knows, the Earth goes around the Sun, and it doesn't take Einstein's brains to understand that. To which Wittgenstein is said to have replied, as great philosophers often do while searching for the real answer, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he went on, I wonder what it would have looked like if the Sun had been going around the Earth. The point being, of course, it would have looked exactly the same. What Wittgenstein was saying was that you see what your knowledge at the time tells you you're seeing. Now, I started with those two stories about horse dung and sky watching, because they illustrate what I want to talk about tonight, which is not horse dung or sky watching. Starting with the fact that the main reason people seem to have difficulty in second guessing what lies ahead appears not to be just a matter of understanding how the new gizmos that we manufacture to make tomorrow better than today, how those gizmos work, but in many cases being aware that change is even happening at all. Being aware that science and technology may be causing change, so to speak, in the deep structure of our lives, in those areas we take for granted as being permanent and immutable, entirely unnoticed by most of us until it's too late. And of course I mean change not in the standard sense of new models doing more efficient, doing more efficiently what you did yesterday, but the totally unexpected ways in which innovation acts to alter the perceptions that society has of itself and the world around, and then consequently to alter on a wide scale that society's forms of thought and behavior. Now, I'm not saying this kind of stuff is easy. It's hard these days just to keep up. Things tend to become outdated so fast that in general, by the time you find you actually understand how some new gizmo works, that means it must already by definition be obsolete. That's a joke. <laughs> just how difficult we, or rather the general person in the street, finds it to keep up with our accelerating rate of change often reminds me of the attitude of the manic depressive. You know, the guy who gets a week off from the clinic, goes down to the beach to get himself a tan. A couple of days later, his psychiatrist back in the hospital gets a postcard. 
It reads, having a wonderful time, why? <laughs> the difficulty in recognizing a change in your circumstances, even as big a change, is that, like most things, being a matter of context. Because the context in which you find yourself conditions what you perceive to be happening, like Wittgenstein's Sun Watchers. So let me kick off by looking at that first. The constraint which can act to hinder your perception of change and its effects imposed on us up until now by what we could call contextual circumstances. And let me take the most basic of all contextual constraints, the one affecting the way you perceive the world neurophysiologically. The brain surgeons among you will forgive me if this is just a little oversimple. Take me. On the retinal cells at the back of your eye, I am not me, am I? I am a pattern of energetic reactions. I'm upside down. I'm focused at the center and fuzzy at the edges. I'm essentially two-dimensional, a two-dimensional energetic reaction caused by impacting photons that trigger off a bunch of neural impulses that go down some nerve or other into the visual cortex of your brain. And at the same time, the air pressure wave that this uh, speaker system here and I, with all this blah, 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 are setting up, the pressure waves cause little hairs inside the cochlea of your inner ear to shake around and send their neural impulses down some nerve or other into the brain. Those two sets of nerve impulses, oral and visual, are basically identical in form. Neither of them is much more than a rather complicated version of the same neural impulse you would get if you scratched your ass. <laughs> So what is it, what is it that makes this perceptual itch me? <laughs> After all, most of you have never met me personally before, and yet here I am, identified, I hope, by most of you, without any doubt whatsoever, as being a human being, male, name of James Burke, standing upright, dressed in this stuffy Brit fashion, short-sighted, and a few million other things that you have already recognized about me. What does that recognition job for you would seem to be the only tool that we have for adapting to change, to new information, or as I'm trying to say tonight, in our case up to now, not adapting very well. I'm talking, of course, about the good old cognitive model, the construct in the brain that you use to analyze all the separate details of me and everything else you experience for identification purposes, using a recognition system that may be made up of hierarchies or organizations of brain cells, interpreting the data coming in from the perceptual systems some of which appear to be there to react exclusively to highly specific experiences. Now, most of these neurons, and there may be, what, 100 billion of them, seem to get to their position in your brain before your birth thanks to a kind of genetically con constrained chemical zip code, which they appear to follow as they grow in the fetus to exact positions in three-dimensional space inside the skull, so they'll be there in a unique pattern where they are supposed to be, so that at birth you can kind of hit the ground running, if that's not an unfortunate metaphor. <laughs> Much more important, the positions most of them go to would appear to form the basic matrix of interacting neurons that will turn out to be the physical infrastructure that shapes your particular personality and of the way that you think, plan, work, perceive everything. Now, I labor this point, and I won't any further, in order simply to suggest that the cognitive model isn't just the psychology department's way of keeping the grants coming in. Who knows here? <laughs> it would appear to take a physical form in your head acting as a recognition system that acts entirely individually and that is constrained in how it does the job of recognizing anything only in the way that it's made up of only everything you know from your personal or genetic experience. Anything that doesn't get recognized in the most basic sense by this model would be rejected as being meaningless. And of course, meaning is defined by your mental construct and not necessarily anybody else's. I hope you'll be beginning to see what all this has to do with being equipped to second-guess change, since what I'm trying to describe may be the structure within which perception of change itself is constrained. Because all perception would be controlled by such a model, wouldn't it? Both at the level of the individual and, thank heavens, because I'm going on rather long and boringly, more amusingly, constrained at the level of entire cultures. At any level, these models are always idiosyncratic, and the views of the world they embody are not always common to all of us. For instance, the general social model in Italy contains a sign like this. It means, come here. Greek girls cause terrible problems for non-Greek boys because when they say no and mean it, they do it like this. What follows is described as culture shock. 
White is the correct color for American brides and Chinese corpses. <laughs> two Arabs can stand very much closer to each other than can two Swedes. The way, as a social model, the way, I didn't think it was that funny. <laughs> This model often expresses its view when it is shared by a society, often expresses its view of another society's model through the medium of jokes. Uh, we make jokes about the Irish, the French make jokes about the Belgians, the Canadians make jokes about the Newfies, you make jokes about everybody. <laughs> Here is a wonderful example of how the Italian model expresses its view of an alien model, the model belonging to another society. I'll tell this joke in English. An Italian businesswoman is on an exhausting schedule, schedule, wrong model, <laughs> on an exhausting schedule running around her country, 13 cities and 13 nights, with very important meetings in every one of those cities uh, that go on all the hours that are available. And so by the time she gets to the last hotel, at one in the morning, she's exhausted, but at seven in the morning, after getting up and having breakfast, she's got to handle probably the most important meeting of her life. So she's on an adrenaline rush already and exhausted, and when, her, when the hotel turns out, when it turns out that her assistant has forgotten to book her a room in this hotel, she's understandably annoyed. And she starts to let them have it in a typical way that those of you who travel a great deal will know as being the principal means to solve such problems. She starts to throw money at them. Gigantic wadges of 20 billion lira, $10.25. You know. <laughs> she goes on throwing these large wadges of money at them and they keep on saying, no senora, the hotel is full, scooping the money. And when it reaches the right amount, they say, well, senora, there might be room. And she says, just give me the key. And they give her the key. And as she races for the lift, elevator, elevator, they say, senora, senora, we don't want you to think that we're corruptible liars. This hotel is actually full. And she comes back and says, what's the catch? And they say, well, senora, look, the room that you are going into is recognized in the hotel world around the world as having the biggest double bed ever made in it. This big double bed is so gigantic that even with the visual acuity of a hawk, you would not be able to perceive that at the other end of this gigantic biggest double bed in the world, well, there's a man. And she throws a key down and says, you just ruined my life because if I don't get the precious few hours of sleep left tonight, I'm gonna to blow tomorrow's meeting and that's my career, my company and my future gone. So thanks a lot. And they said, no, senora, we haven't finished our groveling explanation. The man at the other end of this biggest double bed in the world by the way, it's so big that there have to be two separate bathrooms in this, uh, in this bedroom, one of which will be yours and the other of which will be his. He's got a wake-up call right now, and in fact, we're going to put it through because he's got a midnight plane or whatever it is to catch. So by the time you're anywhere near the room, he'll be gone. And she says, this is so vital that I get some sleep. I'll take this. I'll do this stupid thing. And she takes a key and goes up to the room and goes in through the separate door into her own bathroom and gets ready for bed. And she's so tired when she goes into the bedroom that she's asleep on her feet. And the first thing she knows, it's 6, 5.30 in the morning, her little beeper is going. She, she starts adrenaline rush immediately. This is the most important day of her life. She rolls out of bed, hits the ground running, goes into the bathroom, gets ready, races out through the door, heart pumping, ready to go. And as she's racing out through the door, way down at the other end of the biggest double bit of the world, there's this form and she thinks, well, some businessman, he races downstairs, grabs a cup of espresso, pays the bill and is running for the door flushing with adrenaline, ready for the biggest day of her life. And a policeman, a carabiniere, stops her. And she says, get out of my way. And he says, Signora, you don't understand. And she says, you don't understand. This is the most important day of my life and you're beginning to spoil it. And a carabiniere, the policeman says, Signora, Signora, there was a murder in this hotel last night. She says, what did to me? He says, you spent the night next to the corpse. Ah, she says, I thought he was English. <laughs> I'm Irish. <laughs> a fine linguistic example of model difference, speaking of Irish and English, lies in the way the Irish and the English express themselves. Where the English will say a situation is desperate but not hopeless, we Irish will say it's hopeless but not desperate. And so strong is the model that if reality doesn't fit your model, you alter reality. That is, after all, what visual illusions are. Again, we Irish go further. Lost on a road in Ireland recently with a film crew, I asked a fellow countryman the way to where we had to go. The reality of our necessary route didn't fit his model, so he said, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> so, model constraint, therefore, is what sets the rules, defines the structures, bestows the meaning, sets up the ethics, the values, the beliefs, the aims. Everything that permits the user 
to function as, as an organism capable of planning its future because the model provides a perceived reality and this individual model therefore determines what the universe is. As Wittgenstein said, you see what your knowledge at the time tells you you're seeing. Let me give you a good example of that kind of contextual constraint from the history of science. Back in the 12th century, when we Europeans were looking up, as I said, at what we thought was the sun going around the earth, because we believed that was what was happening, we also thought that we were looking up at a universe that was perfect and unchanging, since it had been created by God, and God couldn't make mistakes, so it had to be perfect. And if it were perfect, there could be nothing up there to see, because there would be no change happening. So we didn't look up much. At the same time, however, the Chinese were busy getting a crick in the neck from doing just that, watching what was going on in the sky, logging everything that moved, and becoming expert astronomers centuries before we did, not because they were clever and we were dummies, but because there was nothing in their model, as there was in ours, that constrained them from seeing things in the sky. We saw no change in the sky because we thought there was none to see. Comets and supernovae, yes, we saw them, but these were written off as public reprimands from God to princes. <laughs> So the model therefore controls all the decisions you make, including those, of course, made by science. As Einstein himself might have said, if you believe the cosmos is made of omelette, you build instruments specifically designed to find traces of intergalactic yolk. And if you don't find any, you call it instrument failure. And of course, in that model, if you come across phenomena like planets and black holes and gravity, you junk them as being non-omelette paranormal garbage. <laughs> And that's the context in which all human decision-making happens, and of course, our science too operates. You work from theories of how the universe works, and then you try to shoehorn the universe into the theories. The theories themselves constrain which bit of the universe you're going to look at and how, and your horizon of expectation dictates what evidence you'll accept as being valid. One example from history, Piltdown Man, the famous hoax fossil found in England at the beginning of this century. What appeared to be the jaw of an ape on the skull of a man, stained from millennia in the soil and with small bits missing. Now, scientists at the time had the means to find out that, in fact, the age stains on the bones were artificial, that the little bits were missing, were precisely those bits that would have shown that the jaw and the skull didn't belong together. And they could have even found out, had they checked, that the teeth had been filed down to make the ape look like a meat eater. But nobody looked, because science was expecting to find a link to complete the verification of Darwin's theory, a link between ape and man, Piltdown was obviously the missing link. Eminent scientists stake their reputations on an untested hoax. The history of science is full of that kind of thing. That definition of the model by what things are supposed to be makes its mark on how science actually describes reality. For instance, the reason today that we refer to electricity in terms of current is because Benjamin Franklin thought it was a liquid. And of course, we still say the sun goes down when we know it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> Malaria is a good example. Malaria comes from malaria, a bad Italian dog Latin for bad air, because in the 19th century, people thought smells caused disease. As a matter of fact, here's a thought. Napoleon planned to protect the health of his troops up the camp on his campaign up the Nile with what was optimistically described as an official bad smell map of Egypt. <laughs> But for anybody at any time, that contemporary definition by the model of what reality is is always the only true one for the time and place. Every model at every time and every place is internally valid. By definition, it must be for the organism to function. There has to be some agreed version, or you can logically say about a person who thinks they are a poached egg, is that they are in the minority. So if every model in history is valid, constrained in philosophical concrete, then why does change happen? What for? Metaphysically speaking, no one model is innately better than any other. I mean, a universe that began at 9 a.m. on October the 10th, 4004 BC, which was official in the 17th century, is intrinsically no less valuable for those who live by a belief in it than is our present uncertain universe forever destroying and remaking itself in never-ending big bangs, or not, if you believe in steady state. All I'm saying is that each of even cosmological theories has at different times found ironclad evidence to support it, all the way from Aristotle to Fred Hoyle. Well, maybe not Fred Hoyle. <laughs> so, given that every model in every place at every time has valid reasons for being the only right one so far, why does the boat get rocked? Why does change happen at all 
when we normally find it so hard to second guess and adapt to, and when, in most cases, things are pretty hunky-dory as they are at the time. And it's not as if we actively encourage change. We are, for good social reasons, that is, the contemporary context in which we find ourselves, really rather conservative. We hang on to our model as if it were the only sure thing in existence, which, of course, it is. We let it go only with an immense reluctance. Change, when it comes, seems to be almost always unwelcome. Take an example from history of that kind of resistance that always tickles me. All that stuff back in the 12th century about the recovery of the European economy after the Dark Ages, the thing that really kicks it along is the arrival from Arab Spain of an amazing new loom. It's amazing because it has foot pedals that frees up the weaver's hands to throw the shuttle back and forward much more quickly, to weave much more cloth, much more quickly, much more cheaply. The Dutch weavers, the best on the continent, smash everyone they can find because they say it will put people out of work. Remarkably modern thinking for the time. <laughs> However, a generation later when the dust is settled, the loom is in use, and now the bottleneck is with the thread makers. They can't keep up with this high-speed loom because they're still teasing the wool out of the mass until, probably by accident, and certainly from left field, as you would say, back probably with one of Marco Polo's sidekicks from China comes the answer in the form of the spinning wheel, which can make thread fast enough to keep up with the loom. The spinning wheel and the loom go together, the production of cloth goes up like a rocket. More riots. Because the cloth is linen, made from plants, because they're cheap, rather than wool, made from sheep, because they're expensive, so the rioters this time are the sheep farmers. But soon everybody is wearing this new cheap linen, and as they wear it out, throwing it away. So around 14th century Europe, there's this gigantic and growing pile of linen rag. So the price of paper drops like a stone. Linen rag paper is the best you can make, and now the raw material is virtually free. More riots. I expect you've guessed. Sheep farmers again. <laughs> Parchment is sheepskin, and now it's too expensive to use. Still, here we are with enough paper to stick on the walls. The scribes are overworked and in demand, and pretty soon they're on strike for higher wages because suddenly it's a seller's market. Everybody wants their paperwork done because the Black Death has just wiped out one third of the population of Europe and the other two thirds are inheriting like crazy, but there is not enough writing ability to go around for all the documentation. <laughs> until, until Gutenberg solves the problem by automating the process with the printing press. Riots in the Vatican. <laughs> the Pope needs the printing press like a hole in the head because it encourages free thinking. Until it is realized that you can use it to print millions of indulgences with. <laughs> For those of you who are not Catholics and don't know what an indulgence was, it was a kind of spiritual credit note. <laughs> Pay now, sin later. <laughs> so, with, with all the demand that follows for instant no interest salvation, the church makes a million money to build the Vatican, pay Michelangelo's bill, and generally get involved in prestige projects that make certain German clerics madder than hell at this consumerist cash and carry approach to salvation, one of whom nails up a few comments, and there, thanks to advances in weaving, is the Reformation. <laughs> well, it's a touch oversimplified, <laughs> but you get my drift. People in general would rather fight than switch. Like the lady in the hotel elevator, a man gets in, she's never met, as the doors close, he says, your room or mine, and she says, if you're going to argue about it, forget it. <laughs> a change in the accepted way of doing things being generally initially perceived to be something that will create problems. So to repeat myself, if model constraint rules and people resist innovation, then why does change happen at all? Well, sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. To begin with, sometimes you don't know change is happening, even if you are personally involved. At the time, you may be looking the right way for your model and the wrong way for what turns out. Like young William Perkin of London in 1858. Perkin is a chemist, and he's going to be the great British Empire imperial hero because he's going to save the empire by discovering a way to make artificial quinine, chemically. At the time, our imperial administration chaps out in the Far East are dropping like flies from malaria, and artificial quinine will do the trick. There is natural quinine out there, but it's Dutch, and typically the Dutch are char charging an arm and a leg. So Perkin is going to save the empire by coming up with this artificial quinine. After a few experiments, he comes up with some interesting sludge, 
one thing it is not is artificial quinine, which is all he's interested in. So he throws it down the sink, sees what it does to the water, and makes a million because he's accidentally invented the world's first artificial aniline dye. Sadly, he makes a million in typically British fashion by selling the idea to a German. <laughs> On other occasions, when model change happens, you may be looking the right way, you just don't get the point. In 1778, two years after a certain event I will not dwell on, we saw nothing wrong with taxation without representation. The, B the BBC would not function without it. However, however, in 1778, one of the things you people have cleared off with, which you don't necessarily need, but which we do, are the Carolina pine trees, because one of the things we used to do with the Carolina pine trees was cook them. If you cook Carolina pine tree under the, you know, in a kiln, you get some black goo out of the bottom of your oven, as it were, and you paint that black goo called pitch on the bottom of your wooden ship's hull and protect it from sea beetles as you cross the ocean, the better to exploit the colonists. <laughs> anyway, you've gone with that stuff, but there's still the rest of the world to rape, so we have a real problem. <laughs> So in 1778, the CD8th Earl of Dundonald, who lives in Scotland, owns a collapsing castle, a few mangy cows, and a couple of tin pot coal mines, thinks up a great wheeze for recouping the family fortunes, which are zilch. He thinks he's going to bake this coal that nobody wants in ovens, get the black goo that comes off the bottom of the baked coal, and put that on the bottom of ships and make lots of wonderful folding green stuff. By the time he reports his experiments to the British Navy, they have just switched to putting copper on the bottom of ships, and so it's thanks, but no thanks. Dundonald is gloomily setting light to the fumes that come off his coal cooking kiln and wondering what the hell to do next, and he just happens to mention these fumes to his friend James Watt. Some friend. A few, a few years later, Watt's sidekick, William Murdoch, quote, invents, unquote, coal gas. Dundonald dies in poverty in Paris from having missed the point. Now, sometimes the catalyst for major change will simply come in from outside your model, like the compass. The compass came to Europe from China in the Middle Ages, a total surprise, was used very happily around the North Sea and the Baltic Sea for a couple of hundred years. And then, around about the early part of the 17th century, experiments began to see why the compass needle started going funny when people like Sir Francis Drake got over here. And this led to people rubbing balls made of sulfur because they got the balls got attractive and made a needle point at them, so the, the sulfur balls were kind of little earth analogues. By the mid-17th century, the more one particular German experimenter, Otto Gericke, rubbed his balls, the more the balls gave off mysterious sparks. <laughs> gave off mysterious sparks, which turned out to be electricity, which of course had nothing to do with navigation. The mechanism of change isn't always by any means a hard to guess science-technology interaction like the ones I'm quoting. The 17th century German businessman and mathematical whiz, Gottfried Leibniz, trying to work out planetary orbit rates, develops the kind of mathematics you'd need to measure infinitesimally small rates of change in the rates of change of a planet's orbital velocity. And he decides that with his new infinitesimal calculus, he has his hands on a tool of cosmic philosophical significance. Because if you could measure that small, would you perhaps be able to measure the basic units of all existence? Because if you were, you might discover the way everything in nature was all made of the same thing. By the end of the 18th century, this view had become known as natur philosophie. We call it romanticism. <laughs> the oneness in everything concept, which it fostered, that united man in nature in Rousseau's concept of the noble savage, led to 19th century romantic poetry, music, uh, nationalism, revolutions, and modern medicine. Because in 1810, a French surgeon called Xavier Bichat, a follower of the new romantic philosophy, went looking for infinitesimally small bits in his business and had discovered body tissue, 21 types of it. Incidentally, he also set the fashion for grave robbing since he couldn't get volunteers. <laughs> However, Bichat, Bichat did notice that during his examinations, he saw that if people were sick, Changes showed up later in the tissue of their unfortunate corpses. Maybe he thought you could correlate these happenings. That, of course, led to what we now call pathological anatomy and the modern concept of disease as a bug-related phenomenon. 
Now, I went through those examples of change in action a bit at length to suggest that when change happens, thanks to the contextual constraint in the way people at the time perceive the event, it's usually a shock to the system. So where have we got? If the mechanisms of change are as serendipitous, as hard to second guess as I have suggested, above all because of con contextual constraint in the model of the time, and yet we are, because of all the ones that went before, now in a world of increasing rates of change, then are there lessons to be learned from the past to help shake loose from this problem of contextual constraint? Is there a pattern of any kind to look out for? Well, there are one or two repeating uh, factors back then that seem to be in the vicinity when change happens. First is the one that appears, appears to be the most obvious of all, that change happens when people need it, necessity being the mother of invention and all that. Well, maybe. Take the opposite case, the ancient Egyptians. The Nile floods every year, one day after a particular appearance by the star Sirius. When it floods, it dumps natural fertilizer and water on the land. You develop a calendar, irrigate and sit back, feet up, mind in neutral. And that's all you need to do to survive, and survive remarkably well. So that may well be why Egyptian society doesn't change much over 3,000 years, because it doesn't need to. On the other hand, take the opposite case. Look at the ancient Greeks. You live on narrow, scrubby coastal strips in little city-states with just enough to survive on. The weather is lousy and uncertain. The barbarians are clobbering you when they get the chance. You've got to get some import-export stuff going up and down the coast just to stay alive. So you think up ways of using your very irregular environment of trying to understand it better in order to control it better to your own advantage, which may be why it is the Greeks of the 7th century BC who first see the stars, not in terms of astrology, but as a systematic aid to navigation. We see the pyramid not as a magic pointed building, but as a structure whose geometry can be tipped on its side and used to measure distances by triangulation. The sexy thing about that is, using the system, you can tell how far out the ship is with your cargo on board and go down to the marketplace and manipulate the prices accordingly. <laughs> in a sense, it may well have been that Greek system for looking at how the universe worked with profit in mind, which today we call philosophy, that started... <clears throat> that started change happening in Western culture at all. What got it accelerating, however, seems almost certainly to be something else that is always around at moments of key moments of change. Something that relates to that watershed I mentioned at the beginning, and that is the ease with which you communicate, move information around. If you look at our unique ability on the planet to use information and the techniques involved in doing so, you see the transmission of information not only causes change to happen, but gives form gives dynamic to the new entity or the new process which is created by the new information itself. If you look back from that point of view, you could argue, of course, that it's the hieroglyphs that make the ancient Egyptian state feasible, that it is the alphabet developed in 1500 BC in northern Canaan, or rather more likely down in the Sinai Peninsula, that makes Greek conceptual thinking recordable. The Chinese invention of paper that permits the spread of the concept of literacy. In the 11th century in Europe, conditions become stable enough after the so-called Dark Ages for roads to be built. People start creeping out of the bushes, and after a short period of time, they're having little marketplaces all over it. One generation later, they are having the medieval industrial revolution powered by the water wheel, and the structure of European society is radically changed. Only 100 years after the arrival of printing in Europe, you've got 20 million books, and most of them in specialist disciplines that could only exist once the specialists had a way of reading each other's stuff. The result, the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th century and the gobbledygook that came with it. I'm not knocking specialization. I should hate to have flown here in a plane driven by a plumber. <laughs> Although with deregulation, who knows? <laughs> so the communication of information seems to have been a prime factor in the mechanism of change. And today, of course, we have communication techniques that make earlier forms look like runes painfully chiseled out in stone. Techniques that indicate a possible radical shift in our ability to generate information, and because of that, to up the rate of change to a new order of complexity. Because, with our present facility for moving information around, we are doing more of one trick than at any time before in history, and that trick, it seems to me, to be the essential mechanism of change. And the key to what information is doing when it creates new things and new social systems. It is the trick of putting things together that were never put together that way before and make one and one make three. To produce something that
that isn't just more than the sum of its parts, but something that actually wasn't there before, a new entity. Like, for example, the way the American engineer Herman Hollerith used the way that electricity flows through wires on contact and put that together with an old idea for automating looms with a sheet of paper that had a pattern of holes in it that you could use as a control mechanism. Hollerith puts those two ideas together and out comes the punch card. And for those of you younger than 25, the computer that follows. <clears throat> a German called Maybach puts together the scent spray, the perfume spray, and gasoline, and produces the carburetor. One and one, making three. And humanity's greatest talent appears to lie in doing just that, finding and operating new relationships between bits of information and ideas. Of all mechanisms of change, that is perhaps the fundamental one. And it's not a very surprising ability for us to have. Logical enough in the light of how the brain itself appears to deal with information. Some of the more recent research on memory seems to suggest that the brain operates in an intensely associative, interactive way whether memory works like some kind of hologram where every bit of the data is stored everywhere or else a more physical alternative memory may use a structure of millions of small brain cell clusters each one containing a core concept and all the clusters or all the parts of the hologram are all in some way interconnected if this is the way it works then to retrieve information you don't need to go you don't need to know where to look for it you can if you have to go in anywhere on the network through some related reminder and then find the target data by following associative pathways from your entry point to the target. If that's how it works, it's a terrific survival mechanism because it's tremendously accessible. So it cuts down decision time because you have multiple gateways to get at the data you need and you don't have a one and only correct way to get the data. So you jump before the saber-toothed tiger does. Well, that's a little anachronistic, but you get my drift. <laughs> now, the other thing about that mechanism would be that as you head along the associative links towards the target data, you might literally go through, uh, neurophysiologically bump into associated relationships between bits of experience or data whose relationship you were not aware of before. That might, in the simplest sense, why we can do the following. This is a chain which you will find extremely easy to follow. Submarine sandwich, lunchbox, kitchen, mother, love, tennis, elbow, Greece, Rome, trident, submarine, and so on. <laughs> this, of course, may be why people write poetry, too. <laughs> You'll be happy to know that at this particular juncture, jokes work like that as well. The punchline makes an association, a connection, if you'll forgive me using the word, that you hadn't thought of before, and you laugh, because although you didn't get to the new association first, as it turns out, you weren't in danger. <laughs> See? Let me try and show you what I mean like this. Take the concepts bird and fruit. Everybody here has those two concepts related in some way in their head. Your relationship may, may be linked to, say, bird tree fruit, bird color fruit, bird eat fruit. Try this kind of associative link. If it's a new one, you'll laugh. If it isn't, I'll go home. A drunk goes up to his host at a party and says, with all the clarity reserved for very small children and the totally zonked adult, <laughs> excuse me, he says, do lemons whistle? And the host says, no, no, lemons don't whistle. No, why do you ask? And the drunk staggers back and smacks his forehead, chagrined and says, oh my God, in that case, I have just squeezed your canary into my gin and tonic. <laughs> what I'm saying is that the basic juxtapos juxtapositional mechanism of innovation may operate exactly as a good joke does. So let me recapitulate, as they say, when things are going to get really boring and you're getting about halfway through. <laughs> Those of you who need to go to the toilet, another 28 minutes. <laughs> there seems to be a contradiction between the way we can think, use this thing, and the way we have been able up to now in history to organize ourselves. On the one hand, this associative structure of the brain I'm talking about would seem to have endowed the individual from the very beginning with an immensely flexible, innovative tool, valuable in the evolutionary sense, 
and capable many millions of times over of dealing with the simple problem of contextual constraint. On the other hand, the structure at the social level seems always to have imposed just such a constraint on what groups of us can and can't do. Let me take that single model constraint thing first. At any time in history, there has, has there not, generally been only one right way to do things, one truth in the model. Whether that truth was the Aristotelian view of the universe of concentric glass spheres, or the Newtonian truth of the universe running like a giant clock with God as a great infallible designer, with logic enthroned and emotion untrusted. Or the 19th century romantic truth of nature as one great sentient organism with emotion enthroned and logic untrusted. Each age its truth, defined by the constraints of the time and of course defended by contemporary science. Each age does its best to perpetuate that truth by making everybody stick to the same set of rules. Deviance is not permitted. In some way or other, visibly or subtly, controls are set up in education, politics, justice, religion, dress, personal interactions, wherever the society of the time sees as the greatest potential source of danger to the status quo, which may be why institutions and institutionalized attitudes come into existence in the first place. Because if you can find some organized way to maximize what your group can do, but at the same time regulate it, protect it from random maverick action, well, you hang on to that idea, whatever it is, as if it were your rock of ages, which of course it is. You institutionalize this wonderful idea. You staff it and you give the staff authority and reward and leave them to their task, which all too soon becomes perpetuating themselves and their institution above all else. A bit like the BBC. <laughs> and after a while, you simply cannot junk these institutions because they have made themselves an integral part of life. Because their function, is now perceived as being irreplaceably necessary for the day-to-day -day bureaucratic humdrum organization of society, leaving the rest of us free to pursue our creative and individualistic ways. Well, that's what the IRS would have us believe. So the rules by which institutions exist often don't get questioned, even though the reasons that made them necessary in the first place may be long gone. Take, for example, representative democracy. If you think about it, representative democracy was the perfect answer to lousy 18th century roads. In conditions where the roads were no more than cart tracks, 17 feet deep in mud, lined with bushes behind which bandits sat waiting to slit your throat, only a couple of egomaniac lunatics would risk the journey to the capital to represent the political views of the hayseeds. These egomaniac lunatics over the centuries became known as politicians. <laughs> now, they were no fools. They were not going to turn around and do that incredibly hazardous journey the next day to say, have you changed your political minds? So acceptably distant return journeys were made, say, every four or five years. These, over the centuries, became known as elections. <laughs> now, the rigidity which that system imposed on what a government could do created views of what governments should and could do. And also, of course, with roads like that, journeys that infrequent, memories that short, two or three political alternatives were about all the system could offer the public in a, world, in a world with lousy roads and no communications worth a damn. Today we have marvellous roads and perfect telecommunications, but exactly the same system. <laughs> in many ways, our institutions are held up as examples of the value of continuity and tradition, because that's easier than constantly reappraising them. And so many of them live with us, hindering our perception of change, because they keep us changing, that because they still exist, the world that created them hasn't changed. That the constraints which operated back then to cause their generation in the first place still operate now, even when some of those institutions are blindingly clearly ill-matched to the issues and structures that science in particular has created since they were instituted. I'm thinking of issues like genetic manipulation, in vitro fertilization, psychotropic drugs, surrogate parenthood, nuclear power, artificial intelligence, the list goes on and on. What I have been suggesting here is that what I think has happened up to the present, that at any time throughout history, we were in the grip of one single model, one certainty, one truth or other, and we were in that grip because the limitations of the knowledge of the time and therefore the tools and systems of the time made anything more sophisticated than a single model version impossible. And fortunately, as I said earlier, Science, in the form of the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th century, screwed things up royally 
when it enshrined moral change itself as an institution, with, above all, the great Cartesian system of thought. Descartes called his system methodical doubt, and if you'll forgive me, I'll paraphrase it. He said, doubt everything. If they tell you it's certain, call it probable. If the word is it's probable, think of it as possible, and if they're trying to peddle that it is possible, forget it. <laughs> and he said, reduce every problem to its component bits and you'll solve the problem. Descartes' methodical doubt and reductionist approach to problems accelerated the rate with which science has brought change, fragmented knowledge, and made its product proliferate beyond the grasp of most people's understanding. Before Descartes' life was a piece of cake, we kind of went around saying, credo ut intelligam, I believe, and through my belief, I come to understanding of the world. After Descartes, we switched it the other way round, intelligo ut credam. Rough translation, when I have examined the proposition for traps, I'll get back to you. <laughs> but that change in attitude brought rates of change that put the model from then on at any time under increasing stress, because the questioning produced new information and new tools, and of course, new social effects all the time, and we always used the new information, didn't we? And as I said earlier, new information is new things. As Norbert Wiener, the great American inventor of the idea of cybernetics used to say, information is everything. The whole world, he said, is a vast collection of, to whom it may concern, messages. So information takes on new form in the new thing or the new system, and sooner or later, of course, somebody always uses it, whatever it is, steam engine, printing press, biotechnology, atomic bomb, and the use of an artifact, a tool, seems almost always to change the user permanently and irreversibly. Now, with that sobering thought in mind, and considering that the products of science and technology, thanks to Descartes, are so prolific today, the key task surely would appear to be now not just getting some new gizmo into circulation and teaching people which button to press, but trying to get people to become more aware of the limitations of their view of what effect it will have, of the need, therefore, to try to forecast its potential secondary or even tertiary effects on us. And that ain't easy. I mean, look how complicated just simple secondary effects of simple, ordinary innovations with which all of us here have lived most of our lives. Two examples, the pill and underarm deodorants. Back in the 60s when the pill was developed, everybody cried, what will happen to morals? Few people dreamt that one day the pill might be regarded by a large portion of the third world as a Western device to keep their numbers and political and economic power down. And as for underarm deodorants, well, back in the 60s, who'd even heard of the ozone layer? But the single model constraint I'm describing is particularly stressed by our more recent forms of innovation because of the way they make demands on and affect our systems at many levels simultaneously because of feedback and interaction. Let me give you just one very, very, very simple, obvious example, the microchip. Sure, of course, the microchip brings cheaper TVs, lean burn engines, video games, and a host of other technological wonders. But on the day, when every corporation takes advantage of this chip to give its people a home computer terminal to work from instead of coming into the office, and even in Stone Age England we're beginning to do such a thing, on that day, what happens to commuting? What happens to the oil companies, the price of oil and the value of the currency, the car industry and all its suppliers, the cities and their infrastructures? And what about the country's transportation systems? And when the flood of working people to the cities becomes a trickle, what happens to the tax base that supports local urban government? What about downtown headquarter office block property values in which your pension is at present safely invested? How will marriages do when nobody ever leaves home? <laughs> How well will people function in their electronic cottages without the exhilaration of daily backstabbing office politics? <laughs> What kind of society would we be, scattered and fragmented like that by the application of one tiny chip, not to mention any other application? Well, I will. Let's say the not-so-distant biochip made from organic materials that begins, very laudably, used in prosthetic arms and legs to give better, more subtle control over artificial limbs. And then perhaps, as it is developed, used to correct some of the grosser abnormalities in the brain, and then perhaps slightly less gross abnormalities in the brain, and then perhaps 
very, very small abnormalities in the brain. And at that point, who decides what deviance is? Or another one, the marvel of giving every mother a choice of sex and physical attributes in her baby before it's born. Terrific idea. A recent survey seems to show that if the majority of Western women were given this choice, it would go, first choice, blue-eyed sons. Second choice, brown-eyed sons. Third choice, grey-eyed sons. Fourth choice, green-eyed sons. Fifth, and all other choices, any eye colour sons. I don't have to explain the ramifications of that. <laughs> Which brings me to the dichotomy I mentioned earlier, the fact that we seem to have brains equipped to handle these sorts of complications, indeed laugh at them as you just have, but not social structures, because those structures are based on old institutionalised models. In simpler words, until now, we haven't had the tools to handle anything but a simple model, a limited information structure, to which you conformed or were punished, exiled, imprisoned, barbecued, whatever it was they did to people at the time. We have already seen, however, that when models do shift, when scientific and technological culture stro stro shock strikes, there is generally a conservative reaction against the change. Nobody wants to rock the boat. Darwin's 19th century theory of evolution was supposed to bring the end of beliefs and standards. Indeed, in some parts of this great country, it is still considered that way. In the 13th century, people said, paper will devalue the words you write on it. With Gutenberg, it was, printing will take away our memories. When people first rode locomotives in the 19th century, it was said that passengers above 30 miles an hour would asphyxiate for lack of oxygen. <laughs> in the Middle Ages, the Pope banned the crossbow because with it, illiterate peasants could nail a mounted aristocrat at 400 paces and zip into the bushes. <laughs> It is, however, painfully obvious from everything so far that our present model is suffering similar agonies of upcoming and radical change in the rate of change. Some of the early symptoms, at least at my end of the world, are less unquestioning obedience of social authority, an increasing disrespect for the rule of majority, uh, sorry, the concept of majority rule, a lack of political consensus, electronic fund transfer can thumb its nose at the nation state because it can move faster than exchange control regulations. Satellite broadcasting is eroding the old 19th century concept of nationalism. My God, in England, we are even seeing French TV. <laughs> now, the single model reaction to all this can be heard in Britain in contextually constrained reactions like harumph. <laughs> but let me suggest very speculatively that instead of moving to a new, immensely more complex, but still single model system, like the ones that went before, but even more constrained, even more controlled through the use of the coming data systems, we might instead, because of the tremendous facility in those same coming data systems, to juxtapose information in a very small way as the brain does, we might well be able to move towards a model so flexible it might be no model at all. Just suppose for a moment that as a result of our understanding of the extent of the influence of context on the way, say, science investigates the universe and tells us what it is, suppose we were to recognize that there is no pattern to the universe that we could know about except the one that we impose on it, and that this pattern changes with the state of knowledge, and that there could never be a time when you could know that the contemporary view you held was the final, true, only view of how things were, that what science or any authority said today, it would unsay tomorrow. Now, this is not such a shocking attitude. It was taken by a group of thinkers in Vienna at the turn of the century and directly fed into Einstein's work. The objection to this kind of view is generally raised that in some ways there are fundamentals that never change, even if the model does. Fundamentals essential to our social cohesion, which must not be endangered. Well, that may be so, but once upon a time it was said about George III, uh, American political joke, that. Once upon a time, we needed god kings, absolute monarchs, cave paintings, no sex before marriage to hold us together. Somehow today, miraculously, we survive without any of them. So suppose you did take this view that I'm talking about. What would you be left with? Let me suggest speculatively that you might well end up with a view of the world a bit like the physicists in the 20s postulated, that in examining the universe, you interact with it, so you can never see it as it might really be if you weren't looking at it that whatever the universe might really be, and nobody's arguing there's a final reality out there, in terms of knowledge, all you could ever have is a present version of it, produced by the present instruments 
that you've chosen to look with. That knowledge, therefore, is something we ourselves manufacture, like the omelette universe I mentioned earlier. That discovery, therefore, is nothing more than what is produced by the imposition of the latest man-made bit of science on some bit of the chaos out there around us. Now, if you accept that, and then you go on and accept with Wittgenstein that it is the knowledge base that controls our actions, and with Norbert Wiener that it is information that structures things, and then you apply that relativist do-it-yourself concept of knowledge I was talking about to the social system, social mechanism, you see what I mean at the beginning about coming up to a watershed in human history, because with the next generation of information systems, maybe capable of millions of inferences a second, maybe capable of learning from experience, of working according to models that set out the value systems we want them to include in their decision-making processes, maybe with that stuff, you have upcoming forms of information processing that will change the definition of knowledge itself, and therefore the nature of our society more fundamentally than at any time since kickoff. I mean, information transmission and processing has done strange things before. Printing made modern science possible. The telephone made skyscrapers work. Knowledge of how to coke coal so that it would burn clean and smelt iron without impurities made the Industrial Revolution happen. The Venturi principle that works in a carburetor allows one American farmer with a tractor to produce enough food to keep 60 people alive. Those funny Polynesian dances where they're all working around wave their arms are not funny dances. They're coded forms of navigational data, and that's how my wife's countrymen got to New Zealand. So you might expect the next generation of data systems to do something equally serious. I wonder whether one thing it might do would be to kill the old single model generated concept of knowledge, the one that we've had especially since Darwin publicized the idea of progress. The mysterious business, you know, of discovering what is out there in the cosmic bushes simply waiting to be found. Well, if it does pull the rug out from under that view of things, we have to face the awkward fact that if knowledge is not the inexorable move towards some final truth, but only what we from time to time say it is, what we from time to time manufacture, then it's our responsibility to decide what that knowledge should be, because of what it will do to us socially when it pops out. That is what it will do to our value systems, which will be in constant flux. Uh, they change, of course they do have changed before, but it used to be that they took a long enough time for you to adapt. My father got medals for killing Germans. 40 years later, I would be put in prison for doing anything remotely like it, but I've become accustomed to the idea that the Germans are really quite nice chaps. But if we are on the verge of having a society where the knowledge base changes fast enough to move the value systems as fast as that, should we be doing something to prepare for it? Possibly a major switch in the emphasis and content of secondary education, for example. Uh, quit teaching children to memorize has been ignored by institutions of higher learning or suppressed in some cases by governments because it had, because of the constraints of the tools of the time, it had to be judged by medieval constraints. Could it write? Could it argue like Aristotle? Was it literate? Could it do mental arithmetic? And did it have a good memory? Qualities which may turn out to be irrelevant in the coming post-Gutenberg era, because with the help of the new machines, we might, for the first time on a general scale, be able to make use of people's abilities to imagine, to think laterally, and to be creative. It seems, by the way, to me, the key thing about the so-called information age is that we do not confuse the avail availability of computerized data with understanding or wisdom or creativity. It still must be said that the most immense supercomputer on Earth can only approximate the cognitive abilities of a sea slug. <laughs> Nothing comes remotely close to this extraordinary thing we have between our ears. So what I mean by freeing people to use their flair is just that, freeing them from the routine drudgery, giving them back up so that in the best sense they can use their brains in a way that we have never been able to profit from socially until now. The uniquely human, creative, whistling lemons approach to thinking, if you like. Serviced, supported, enhanced by the new information systems. What kind of world, I come to the end, what kind of world, world would that give us? Well, let me make a few general guesses from within the manure-ridden limitations of my own present model, of course, which gets me off the hook. Such a world might turn out to be politically pluralist in the extreme. We would call that lacking in consensus, a bit like the Italian model of government. <laughs> Such a world might be intensely pragmatic. We would call that without permanent values. 
highly individualistic, we would call that fragmented. Locally self-sufficient, we would call that isolationist. Culturally immensely varied, we would say disunited. Libertarian, we would say permissive. But above all, perhaps articulate, open-minded, and tolerant, we would say without a sense of direction. It might, who knows, be a society working in a very small way, in a very distant way, like the brain does, in a kind of balanced anarchy, kept in balance by the data systems that may be the closest we have yet come to comprehending and controlling the mechanisms of change and their effect. The clearest example so far of the way science and technology manufacture not just gadgets, but new forms of reality and social change. And as I hope this brief look at innovation and our perception of it has shown, that kind of activity would appear to be the very activity for which these hundred billion neurons we've all got seem to be ready-made, thanks to their associational structure. It would seem to me real maturity to build that kind of world where we were, in the very best sense, symbiotically linked to our information technology. Such a thing has happened before. Once in the past, steam power enhanced our physical capabilities with surrogate strength, and the steam engine changed our society permanently and fundamentally. With the new data systems, we may be on the verge of doing the same favor to the human brain with even more far-reaching results. And as for the old shibboleth that we will be ruled by these machines, well, that has been said about every innovation so far in history. And in any case, I have a healthy respect for our abilities to stay at least level with whatever machine we create. And I end with a short story that tells you where I got this naive, childish technological optimism, apart from the fact that, of course, I believe the great whoever he was that said, Pessimists are no longer part of the problem, or rather the solution, excuse me. Back in the days when, as you heard, I was the BBC's chief Apollo correspondent and anchor, I had the privilege and pleasure to spend many months of the year uh, in Houston and at the Cape. And I got to know those quite extraordinary people, uh, the astronauts, and the engineers and scientists who backed them up in the, I think, what was probably more highly regarded abroad than here, the landings on the moon. Now, our mandate was, I think, a little bit different from your, from your networks because we were asked to explain why every mission was different from the one that went before and therefore to look at its technological and scientific ramifications because our audience was keen on that kind of stuff. P.S. I think that's why we kept on getting high audiences and yours dropped after Apollo 11 because when you run it like a theatrical show, when, who wants to see a show when you've seen the same plot before? Like blue touch paper, go to the moon, come back. <laughs> anyway... Uh, because of the mandate, we had to spend a lot of time uh, talking to the guys who put the stuff together and uh, the astronauts who dealt with it on the moon. And one of the things I came across was a thing called a cuff checklist. Um, it was a kind of ring binder with plastic leaves, small, worn on the cuff of the spacesuit uh, as an aid memoir. Now, this is not because astronauts are stupid and need to be told what they're doing, but because if you have it in your pocket, you put your hand in your pocket on the moon, you get seriously dead. So. So on these leaves were a great detail, a kind of minute-by-minute um, minute calendar for what they had to do, because of course there was only this much oxygen and they had this much work. They couldn't get this much work done because they didn't have this much oxygen. That's why they had to follow this thing minute-by-minute. Minute. Each of these cuff checklists were in total gobbledygook, and we never tried to explain many of them to the public because we couldn't understand them either. Uh, they would say things like, if the LR cubed fails, let's try the following repair. Uh, number one. Uh, squelch outlock CV25 uh, and squelch outlock twice, uh, allow 2.5. Uh, uh, if this fails, try two. Squelch outlock mode B, blah, 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 three, and it got worse and worse and worse. Until right at the bottom of these checklists, which were primarily for the astronauts to do something about repairing a piece of equipment that had gone wrong on the surface of the moon. I mean, put yourself in their position. You are 240,000 miles from the nearest workbench. A billion people are watching your every move, especially the poor slob of a scientist back on Earth who created this bit of white-hot technology which you're about to reverentially lay in the lunar dust. You turn the switch on and it doesn't work. You've got to do something. Back in Houston, in the back rooms, a guy's tearing his hair out. Something must be done. So they have these checklists, repair checklists. As I explained, each one got more and more complex, more and more gobbledygook, until right at the bottom came something we could explain to the public. And it was a line a suggestion, a final suggestion, made by NASA to these guys uh, as a final attempt to stave off a technological disaster on the surface of the moon for the very first time in human history. And it was a line that, for me, goes all the way back to the caves. 
and echoes our relationship all the way from the very first time that anybody innovated all the way up to today, and which gives me my naive optimism about our ability to handle the technology that we create, because at the end of these immensely complex technological suggestions for how to stave off disaster up there, it said, if all other options to this point have failed, kick with lunar boot. <laughs> I'm not going to do the brothers and sisters thing. Uh, uh, I've been told that uh, there is a few minutes for anybody who might be foolish enough to have a question. First of all, I can't see you. Second of all, if I could, I, I mean, I'll do it. If you put a finger in the air, I'll pick somebody who looks innocuous and revoice whatever question they ask to my advantage and duck it. Out there in the outer Stygian, I'll repeat what the gentleman, lady, dog, cat, says. I can't see you, sir, but I presume you're a sir. Yes, he is. 